Welcome everyone to this special recorded edition of ASA's Webinar Wednesdays. My name is Tony Mala. I'll be your host today and we're going to be in this session looking at the growing need for periodic motor vehicle inspection programs, also known as PMVI. Joining me on the broadcast today uh, will be Tom Pipo, the uh, owner and of Tri-County Motors and our Mechanical Division, Dri Dri Division Director. Uh, Tom has been very involved through the uh, Mechanical Operations Committee uh, in ASA's efforts to um, defend the PMBI programs. Tom, welcome. Are you there? Yes, I'm here, Tony. Welcome, everybody. So um, what we'd like to do, uh, this, this will be a, uh, a presentation where we're going to go over a number of different uh, issues surrounding the preventive maintenance and vehicle inspection programs. And um, the three things we're really going to cover are what are PMVI programs, uh, what are the benefits, and really why are they needed? Um, as some of you may be aware, uh, PMVI programs have been declining across the country for a number of years now as legislators don't quite see the value uh, in having periodic motor vehicle inspections. And we hope this presentation will uh, help clear up a couple of, uh, of those misconceptions about what PMVI programs do, but also to educate everyone about the need for this, not just for the safety aspect that we all think of when it comes to brakes and tires, but also as it relates to some of the sophisticated safety systems that are on the vehicle these days. So without further ado, let's get started. And uh, uh, let me start with the uh, definition of what are PMVI programs. A periodic motor, motor vehicle inspection program is generally defined as a regularly scheduled vehicle inspection mandated by state law and performed by qualified, certified, or licensed inspection technicians. The purpose of any PMVI program is to ensure that the vehicles being driven on public roadways are operating safely and within the specifications established by the governing body, sometimes the requirements and the uh, brake th rotor thickness specifications, for example, would vary from state to state. Um, the uh, Most PMVI programs are annual, uh, usually a once a year inspection, and may exempt new vehicles from such inspections for a period of from one to three years. Some states tie their annual PMVI safety check uh, to registration renewals for convenience. I know we do that here in uh, Texas and in my former state of Virginia. And Tom, I believe Michigan has a, uh, a fairly robust inspection program, do they not? Unfortunately, Tony, they do not. No. Oh. Yeah, it, years ago in the metro areas, they had an emission testing, but they, it's been many years since they've done a safety inspection. Hmm. And uh, you, you've been pretty vocal on this um, uh, about the need for these inspection programs. Do you have any reason why Michigan got rid of theirs some time ago? Was there any, uh, uh, do you have any, any inkling as to why it was canceled? It was probably political more than anything. It does cost a little money to do these. And the way they would do their inspections back in the 70s, they just have inspection lanes on the highway. They'd pull everybody over and just give them a quick... Uh, honk the horn, flash the lights, let's make sure everything works and you're safe for the highway. But it was very rudimentary and unfortunately it just went away. I think uh, at that point they were getting federal money if they had a safety inspection. And some of that stuff may have gone away. Hmm. Well, I know, as, as you said, a lot of the, uh, it's, it's usually a political decision. At least, at least that seems to be the pattern because um, again, the legislators really don't see the benefits and, and their constituents often complain about the cost, although we would consider it to be a very minor cost uh, for the for the safety inspection. But what are the benefits of a, a PMVI program? And here, here's one definition. A periodic motor, motor vehicle inspection program can help reduce accidents and ensure that unsafe vehicles are found and repaired or kept, kept off the road. In addition, periodic vehicle inspections can help consumers save money by finding small problems before they become larger and more expensive to repair. Uh, generally, any revenue generated from a state program is used for anything from highway maintenance or improvement to consumer safety education. But it, it does generate a, a, a revenue stream that, that can be used to support uh, the public infrastructure. So there's that benefit. But um, I, I believe, Tom, and you may know, there's been some studies lately that uh, have actually shown a, a definite uh, safety benefit. I know there was one done, I believe, in Pennsylvania recently. And uh, I know our Washington representative has talked about um, some of the uh, some of the studies that are available out there. 
Yes, there has, Tony, and I'm, I don't have those numbers right in front of me, but every time they've done a study, there's been uh, a, a lot of a lot of lives saved in states that have uh, the safety programs or the, the maintenance inspection programs against the states that do not. Hmm. Well, we have some some data I'm going to show in a minute about um, just how bad the problem is, but which brings us to our next point. Why are PMBI programs needed? And this this is a startling statistic to me. The best estimates state that only about half of all vehicle owners maintain them on a regular schedule. Vehicle neglect can pose a serious risk to public safety, and having a mandatory PMBI program will ensure that all vehicles operating within a state do so with the secure knowledge that they have been inspected for safety problems, and those issues found uh, have been found and corrected. Um, I know in a previous discussion, Tom, we were talking about, you know, they, they mandate uh, commercial vehicles to be inspected. Heavy trucks have to be have to be safety checked. Yes, Yet it do. always yeah it always seemed incongruous to me that that all the vehicles around them don't have to be on the highway. And, yeah, uh, crazy stuff. It, it's it's you know it, you have to wonder, but uh, but I know that um, uh, that again uh, the the PMBI programs that I'm familiar with. I grew up in a state of Pennsylvania, which has had a program still does for as long as I can remember. But um, one of the things that, that has changed the landscape beyond the, uh, the typical safety items, which are tires and brakes and those sorts of things, and we'll have some interesting photos to show you in a, in a short minute. Um, the other side is, is some of the newest technology that's coming out. Um, it's called Advanced Driver Assist Technology, also known as ADAS. And these systems use sensors such as sonar, radar, and LIDAR, which is a laser radar, along with sophisticated computerized stability control, automatic braking, and traction control systems to actually correct for driver error and reduce the chances of an accident. And as, as we may know, 90% of all accidents actually are caused by some sort of driver error. So these and other safety systems are now standard equipment on some vehicle models. Uh, we expect at some point they will be standard equipment on all vehicle models, but their effectiveness depends on everything working properly. Um, a PMVI program can also incorporate a regular system health check to make sure that these advanced safety systems are operating correctly. And uh, one of the uh, stories I tell is, you know, uh, we're, we're basically conducting the largest social experiment in history. We are conditioning our driving population um, to think they're better than they are. Um, uh, Anti-lock brakes, uh, traction control, stability control will actually correct for a driver mistake, say going into a corner a little bit too quickly or when the road is slick. And a driver may go take that same route home every day for a year and, the, and never knowing that the only reason he made it through that turn at that speed was because the car uh, corrected for his error. And then comes the day where that system isn't working, he does everything he has been doing and all of a sudden there's an accident involved. That's absolutely um, right, Tony. And, yeah. and Tom, let's talk about these ADAS system technology for a second sure. because I know you, you look at these. Yeah, they do have warning lights on on the system, but not all not all malfunctions within that system will will trigger a trouble code, will they? No, no, not at all, and and it won't always turn a light on either. You know, sometimes the system will just stop working without warning and not not let you know that it's not going to correct for you. Uh, for years, we've had anti lock brakes and in, in my own cars, anti lock brakes. I have good tires on them. We have traction control, and you can drive foolishly in the winter, and you know. Being, being a mechanic like I am, I drive customers' cars, and they might have traction control and anti-lock brakes, but they have bad tires. You don't go anywhere. you got traction on the road. Um, but, yeah, you, you don't always get a warning that the system's going to stop working for you, so you, mm. you've got to make sure this stuff keeps going. Another interesting point is anti-lock brakes and traction control were mandated by the government about 2012-2013. But there's, they thought it was such an important safety item that all the cars built in, and on the roads in America should have it. But they made no provision to make sure that it keeps working. Once you buy a car and it leaves the dealer's lot, you know, anything can happen. Hmm. Well, and the problem actually gets worse. I mean, we talk about advanced driver technology, um, making sure that it's all working. But here's another statistic. Uh, the strongest reason, I think, for a robust PMBI program is reflected in the average age of the vehicle fleet in the U.S. Uh, the average age of vehicles on the road today is nearly 12 years, and this is what surprised me. The largest growing segment of vehicles is 16 years and older. 
these aging vehicles need to be able to meet safety standards for repair and maintenance in the interest of public safety for all motorists on the road. But we're talking about a pretty broad uh, a span in technology, aren't we, Tom, between a 16-year-old vehicle and a vehicle that's being built today? Oh, definitely. Vehicles can change in two or three years, uh, make all the difference in the world on their technology. Hmm. Well, for this and a bunch of other reasons, um, ASA strongly believes that PMBI programs are not only necessary, uh, but worthy of defense. And we're not alone in that feeling. Several of the other associations within the industry have joined ASA. But, you know, the usual argument is, well, show me the data. Um, okay, well, it's, it's tough to prove something didn't happen. Um, and, uh, you know, if you wait until the aftermath of a crash um, to determine what went wrong, uh, that works fine in the aviation industry, perhaps. But, but there, it, the people that generally are at the scene of a vehicle trash, crash aren't trained, um, uh, you know, forensic investigators when it comes to that. Generally, the vehicles are pushed off to the side of the road or towed away. Uh, without any real investigation of as to why something happened we again we assume 90 percent of the cause is driver error but um, some organizations out there actually um, have have given us some statistics that make make us believe that maybe that's not entirely true the car car council is one of them every year the car car council uh, and they've been around for 20 years um, have what they call free vehicle check lanes uh, some of our members participate many shops across the country offer free vehicle inspections during National Car Care Months. Uh, there's, it happens twice a year in May and, and October, so spring and fall. Uh, and the data gathered on overall vehicle condition as it relates to basic maintenance offers an impartial look into the value of periodic vehicle inspections. Um, now bear in mind, the Car Care Council program was a free voluntary program that arguably attracts the type of vehicle owner that is most likely to maintain their vehicle but even if we assume that to be the case, the failure rates among this population are higher than what is generally believed. Let me show you some data. And I know this may be a little hard to see, but uh, from 2000, uh, the data that the Car Care Council supplied us for this presentation, you'll notice that the overall vehicle failure rates where they found at least one defect that was maintenance related that needed to be addressed, could have been low tire pressure, it could have been a bad light or something like that. The bulk of the vehicles had at least one thing wrong with them, and several had several things wrong with them. And the alarming part is the lowest point it, it has um, was down, uh, oh, I don't know, around 72 uh, percent, I guess. But if you look at the um, uh, latest statistics that we have are from April, 88 percent of the vehicles that they inspected had at least one thing wrong with them. And that number has been increasing since 2013, as you can see here. So, again, the, the individual's uh, driver aren't necessarily taking care of their vehicles in the first place. And the, the Car Care Council data uh, would tend to support that. And, Tom, you look at vehicles every day um, when, when customers come in for, for all different types of service. And I assume you uh, uh, usually give them a, a quick once over. Does your experience support this? Do you find that, that a number of times you'll be inspecting a customer's vehicle and you'll find something they didn't know was wrong? Um, I think these numbers are a little low, Tony. I will say the failure rate of cars that I see, 90% uh, or higher. Very few cars, I'll give a clean bill of health. Say they come in for an oil change, and we always give them a precursory inspection, uh, a kind of a mini PMVI, if you will. And we shake and rattle the ball joints and the tie rods and check the lights, and very few cars go out with a clean bill of health unless they are regular customers and they're in every three months. These are the people that maintain their cars, and they have very low repair bills. Hmm. Well, again, this data would seem to back it up. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it could be something minor, but in many ways it's not. And, and uh, let's take a look at some of the, some of the evidence we have gathered uh, for, on some typical safety issues. Now, these photographs that you're looking at were gathered from a variety of shops from across the nation uh, who do digital vehicle inspections for their customers. They offer this as a service but in some cases it was driven because the car was in for a, a periodic state inspection or just in for a general vehicle check but many shops are now using this digital vehicle inspection and are providing visual evidence of safety issues they find on vehicles every day and this is a, a new capability that we have within the industry to actually track and record some of the things they find now some of the, what they find are the result of neglected maintenance Others, the result of a failed attempt at performing maintenance or repair by an 
inexperienced or unqualified individual. But in any case, the results can be quite dangerous. If you take a look at these brake pads, uh, you'll notice the white line here. I'm showing it with my cursor, um, which indicates uneven wear uh, due to either a mechanical problem or improper installation. The, the portion that shows some wear is actually lower than the outside portion, which is defined by that white line. That white line is, is a light reflection of what is a step in the brake pad material. The entire surface of this brake pad is supposed to be contacting the rotor. And when you look at, this is the rotor those pads came off of, and you'll notice here, the pad isn't sitting flush with the rotor face. And I think, Tom, you and I were talking about this, and you said that could be either an undersized rotor or more likely the pads are installed pro improperly. Is that correct? Yeah, Tony, I think that rotor's too tiny. I'm just kind of looking at the way it fits in the brackets, and uh, there's too much clearance there. Somebody mm -hmm. put the wrong parts on this car. And there, and there you go. And in, in the process, creating a safety hazard. Again, yes. yeah, the correct size rotor, the edge of this pad would be flush with the end of that, uh, the end of that rotor. So this actually compromises the vehicle braking system. That can increase braking stopping distances. If you do have a, um, this is an example of where a mechanical problem can affect a vehicle with with an advanced driver assist system on it by reducing the capability of the braking system. These things are calibrated to know what the stopping distance is. Perhaps an even scarier picture is this one. Um, this is a severely worn brake pad. But Tom, you, you, can you explain to me what I'm looking at here? <laughs> well, that's, wheels off there, Tony, and you're looking at the brake caliper. Now, the the part just under the the U-shaped slot is the uh, backing plate for the brake pad itself. That's the steel host that the uh, friction material is bonded to. And it has worn down so much that it has actually slipped out of its ways, slipped out of the little grooves it rides in, and it's wedged down in between the bracket and the rotor. I'm going to guess right now that wheel's not able to turn at all. It's, it's locked right up. Wow. And, and again, you can imagine if this happens, if the, if the rotor gets to, or the brake, brake system gets to a point where it locks up on the road at road speed, uh, that would cause, correct me if I'm wrong, a violent pull to one side or the other, would it not? That's going to cause some kind of issue, you bet. Yeah. And, you know, it's not only this. This one at least is something that's pretty obvious to a visual inspection, but there's stuff that only a periodic motor vehicle inspection would find. This next slide illustrates that. Here's a drum brake system. This is normally completely covered with a brake drum. You can't see it. What that, all that goop you see there is, is grease. It probably is the result of a failed grease seal. But this was totally invisible to, the, uh, to, to a visual inspection until you removed the brake drum or saw the grease leaking out of the adjustment hole. But either way, it required an inspection by a qualified technician to see it. And it's not something an owner might pick up. And um, although brake drums do less of the braking, um, what is it, 60-40, Tom? What's the ratio yeah. of? About that, 20, 60, 40, 70, 30, depending on the way the car or the truck is built. Mm -hmm. But even at that, let's assume it's on the lower end, and this represents 30% of your stopping power. And again, worse if it's only on one side of the vehicle, where this side of the brake, brake wasn't functioning at all, the other side was, again, could involve some handling controls. These are the kinds of things that a, a, a periodic motor vehicle inspection will find. Say, Tony, um, I just want to make a note on that picture. That that type of setup is used on three-quarter ton trucks and larger. So this vehicle is probably heavily loaded and really needing their brakes. Well, and, they, and they just weren't there to, to work for them. And an even bigger problem, again, if it's on if it's on something carrying quite a bit of weight. Yes. And this, this is one of my favorite horror pictures here. Um, usually what happens when you neglect brakes is you, you damage the brake rotor. And this is one of those issues where I was saying earlier, if you catch a problem early, if you catch the brake pads when they're just about worn down to the nub, but not, you know, there's still some friction material left, you probably won't damage the rotor. Um, if you ignore those brake pads and uh, use the metal on metal as your stopping material, as this customer did, this is what results. Um, <laughs> those silver hash marks there, um, are cooling fins. There's supposed to be a whole nother metal plate over top of this. That's how worn down this brake rotor is. The entire rotor surface, the outer rotor surface or inner rotor surface is completely gone. Um, and again, these air-cooled ro rotors, um, some vehicles, usually smaller vehicles, can have solid rotors. 
but it's the larger, heavier vehicles that generally use the cooled rotors, where they have two surfaces with the cooling, uh, uh, cooling fins in between. And again, it's a heavier vehicle, harder to stop. Tom, how often do you see something this bad? Not too often, Tony. You know, when I do see something like this, the customer's complain is, geez, it just started making noise. But I think what they really mean is it started making a different kind of a noise. They got used to the old grinding noise that was going on for six months, but you know, you're just running out of stuff to, to, to wear out here. Yeah, I have, to, I have to ask you, in your professional opinion, how long do you think it would take for, uh, for that damage to get that bad? How long was this individual driving that vehicle without that inner uh, rotor? Well, I would guess uh, a month or more, you know, wow. grinding metal, metal before it got down to this point. That's, wow. just, that's just neglect and abuse. Yeah, that's insane. And, and worse, it's a safety problem. Again, uh, if, you, if you have a, a panic stop situation, the brakes are not going to be there. And if they are there and something locks up, it, it could result in what the engineers refer to as a sudden catastrophic loss of control. Yes. Usually resulting in a crash, yeah, and the and the results can be quite tragic. And here's another issue that um, you know we talk about periodic motor motor vehicle inspections. We often talk about brake systems because that seems to be the on top of everyone's mind. But there's lots of other problems that a visual inspection will pick up. In this particular case, this picture shows a broken spring. Um, again, this will significantly affect the handling of the vehicle and uh, compromise stability certainly. Um, and again, it's something that um, that should have been, you know, uh, sensed by the driver that something was wrong. They, they tend to choo choose to ignore these things. But this is the type of, of damage that a, a quick visual inspection would, would pick up. And here's another example of that. We're talking about springs. This is a bracket. This, there's one, two, three studs of this bracket. It's being held on by one final attachment point. That's the only thing holding that bracket in, in place. And again, it is way out of out of position. So this is a leaf spring on the back of a vehicle that is being held on by one single bolt where it should have had four. And these are actually sheared off. Tom, what would cause that sort of damage? Could this have been overloaded or? It looks like on this case overloaded probably. Yeah, where we live in northern Michigan, we get a lot of salt and they will rust off actually and, and do the same thing. But looks like a lot of good metal there. That's just uh, overloaded. I, I'm looking at the red dust on the leaf springs too. There's been a lot of pushing and wear on that. So I'm sure it's a heavy load. Hmm. Speaking of springs, Tony, that last picture of the coil springs, I want to point out that coil springs on the front end of a car, and most all of them have coil springs on the front. If they break in this fashion, it's very likely that that spring could come out of place and puncture a tire as it often does. And again, sudden catastrophic uh, loss of control. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, bad things can happen, as they say. And here's one of my favorite bad things. Some of you may have uh, have heard mechanics talk about ball joints and you wonder what, what is a ball joint? What does it do? Well, if you look at the picture of the Jeep, you'll see that right hand passenger side tire is completely disconnected from the control arm that it's supposed to be connected to to steer the vehicle. Um, this is a ball joint here at the bottom. You'll notice these two pieces are completely separated and they should be attached. Tom, how, how many cars would you estimate are running around with worn ball joints that need to be replaced, just from your experience of what you've seen? From what we see, Tony, probably uh, 30 to 50 percent of the cars on the road have worn ball joints. Wow. You know, and they, and they again, have perceptible play and recommended, recommended to have them replaced. Now, they do sometimes allow some play in a ball joint, and that's absolutely normal, but not a lot. And, and there's specific specifications that's why they're called specifications and it's just uh hundreds or, or thousands of an inch is all that's allowed hmm. and this is obviously worn well beyond that but again you can imagine this is this is all supposed to be connected uh that is your steering control of your vehicle imagine that this let go at road speed you can see where that would absolutely cause an accident and going back to what i was saying earlier about you know the investigation that doesn't really happen at the, if this car was was on the side of the road, um, you know, it may this may have been regarded as as if if it did cause an accident and the whole front end was crushed, they may have thought this was caused by the accident as opposed to being the cause of the accident. Yes. And this is where I think the uh, the digital vehicle inspections are helping us get a much better picture of just how uh, important it is to have some sort of periodic vehicle inspection. 
And you know, uh, Tom, we were talking earlier about the average age of the vehicles being 16 years, their fastest growing population being 16 years, average age is 12. Why is that important? Well, because no matter where you live, there is corrosion. Now, granted, it's much more common in the in the snow belt states, but even in uh, even in Florida, you know, or any place near the the sea where you have salt air, there are things that will cause corrosion. You will drive places that that are not in the Sun Belt occasionally, and this is an example of uh, some of the severe rust that can build up, particularly on an older car. And Tom, vehicles are built much better these days with with much better materials, but how often do you run into uh, significant corrosion, especially being up in Michigan? Any vehicle, I'd say five years old or older, driven regularly in the wintertime, has some rust that we're looking at. Um, you know, is it just punctures, holes in the body that exhaust can get in, or is it structural stuff? Um, but five years and over, we start looking real hard on, on what's going on here. So it doesn't take an old car to be an old rusty car. Hmm. And, and again, you know, a significant um, uh, corrosion damage will, uh, will weaken components. It'll, it'll cause things to fail. Um, and in, in an extreme case, uh, again, you can see this, this uh, vehicle structure has been compromised significantly. It, will, it could weaken the frame structure, but more dangerously, it could open up a hole into the passenger's compartment where exhaust fumes could come in. But we'll talk about exhaust fumes in a second. But there's one more type of, uh, of issue that periodic motor vehicle inspections are critical in detecting, and that is the do-it-yourself stuff that some people do. Tom, what are we looking at here? <laughs> well, Tony, this is a picture I had submitted a while ago. This is a, a Volkswagen. The guy who brought it in, he uh, lost his brakes. Well, we opened the hood, and you see those little silver bullets kind of hanging out of that rusty uh, that's the brake master cylinder. Those are bleeder screws, and they're blocking off two of the brake lines already. Um, I think he only had front brakes when he came in, and one of the front brake lines ruptured, so then he had no brakes at all, and no telling how long he's been on the road driving this way. Um, only half the brakes working and no safety backup whatsoever. Um, I gave him an estimate for repairing it properly, and I think he sold this car to the recyclers, so now it's being dismantled for parts. And probably we're better off because of it, I'm sure. Yes. But this is the kind of, of do-it-yourself type of damage, if you will, that some people do. And we understand, you know, not everybody has the money they need to fix their vehicles. But putting your life at risk uh, is not the answer. And again, uh, in many Tony, ways... Tony, not only was he putting his life at risk, he was putting everybody's life at risk. That's where I was going. It's not yeah. just you, it's the people around you and the people yes. in the vehicle. You know, and when you think about the fact that, you know... Um, the, your, your typical family chariot carries the most precious resource in the universe, which is human life. And, you know, you're talking about your wife, your kids, yourself. Um, this is this is something that that shouldn't have even been considered, let alone tolerated for a period of time. And Tom, I think you said he'd been driving for a while with it. So it just it just boggles the mind that that could have been next to me on the highway at 70 miles an hour. Yes. But they get even more creative, we found. And here's another example. This is a downspout, a rain downspout, uh, aluminum, light gauge, like you have on the side of your house. Definitely not designed to be an exhaust pipe, which, of course, is what it was being used for. Uh, Tom, do you want to go through how many things are wrong with this picture? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. I don't know if that's a Coke can or, or house wrap he used for a, a caulking to attach the pipe to the, looks like the catalytic converter where the outlet temperature could be a thousand degrees. Oh boy. No, that and carbon monoxide fumes up in the car. Boy, that's, uh, I don't know. That's just not yeah. right. It, it's just amazing. And, uh, and again, this is, this is the type of stuff that, that we see. And this is just one example. Um, there are shops all across the country who every day are, are taking pictures of this type of, of issue that we're discovering on a vehicle. And again, with the best of intentions, you know, I'm sure this driver thought they were doing the right thing at some point to just get the car in. But, but again, compromising safety, putting your own life and others at risk is not the way to go. Um, it, it, there's just too much at stake. Vehicles are too big, too heavy, drive too fast, uh, and you cannot cheat the laws of physics. And it's amazing how far an out-of-control vehicle will slide. But uh, and the beat goes on. Um, more statistics from the automotive uh, or from the Car Care Council: tires, 
tires are the most critical uh, safety feature you have on your vehicle because they're your contact with the road. It's four small patches, and that is the only thing that your vehicle has uh, connecting you to Mother Earth. And if you look in uh, April 27th or April 2017, 21% uh, of the vehicles inspected, a quarter of the vehicles that were inspected had a low tire pressure situation. Um, and 12% had a, a tire depth problem. Tom, what can low tire pressure do, um, or more to the point, not do, uh, that well, would compromise safety? First thing, Tony, low tire pressure will cause the tire to overheat. If the tire gets hot, it just starts, the rubber inside just starts separating from the, the plies that hold it all together. The tire can disintegrate on you. Um, that's the reason we have tire pressure monitors and indicators. If you remember the old uh, Firestone fiasco on the Ford Explorers from several years ago, that's what brought that around. Uh, low pressure will also uh, skew your handling. Your car will get real squirrely. You won't have the proper uh, grip on the road. You lose control. Hmm. And actually, after tire pressure, we talk about tire depth. Look at this beauty. This was a tire that was on a vehicle when it came into the shop. And, you know, sudden blowouts are often the cause of an accident, uh, particularly by an inexperienced driver. Um, here's an ex example of an extremely worn tire with the metal cord showing through the side. Uh, Tom, this tire is in no way, shape, or form safe for the highway, is it? No, it's not even safe to take off the rim, Tony. You're going to cut your hand on that thing. Mm. And this is why, again, um, most uh, half the vehicles on the road are not maintained properly. Um, uh, whenever I talk to any consumer reporters about what consumers should do, I often recommend a simple walk around of the vehicle, just like pilots do before you get on an airplane. One of the things you should look at is your, is your tires. Uh, this it don't need to be a an ace technician to see that that tire needs to be replaced. And again, that's something that periodic motor vehicle inspections would uh, pick up. Most states have a tread depth, uh, minimum tread depth specification that can be measured. It you know you either pass or you don't. Um, there's no judgment calls here. And uh, and again, it's it's a uh, it, it's a critical safety issue. And worse, uh, with tires, not everything is, is so obvious as what we just showed you. Here's a picture of a tire with two, see these bubbles on the inside? That's a blowout waiting to happen. And uh, this is on the inside of the tire, so it may not have been picked up in a visual inspection. So it's all the more reason why it's important to, uh, to have your vehicle looked at by a professional technician at least once a year which again is what a PMBI program would do. Tom, do you have any customers that, that um, do you offer any kind of a, of, a, of a periodic inspection service that they can subscribe to? Oh, definitely, uh, definitely, Tony. A um, couple of things that I offer is, is uh, pre-purchase vehicle inspections, which is pretty much a PMBI, so they know it's going on, know that they're buying a safe vehicle that doesn't need a lot of repairs. And once a year, uh, I I tell my customers they should have a what we call a pre-trip inspection, you know, especially right about now. Everybody wants to go on spring break next week, and we'll look the vehicle over, look at all these safety items that we're just talking about today. We'll look at the tires, we'll look at the brakes, we'll look at the ball joints, we'll look at the exhaust, and just make sure they can make their trip down to warmer climates and back safely. But I want to point out on this poor old tire with these bubbles and blisters on it, you know, it's not really the tire's fault. Some of that stuff's caused by bad driving habits. Usually a blister on the sidewall, that tire's been pinched real hard, been run over a curb, and that poor sidewall rubber was pinched between the curb and that tire rim and, and caused it to separate on the inside. So careful driving habits can eliminate some of these problems also. Hmm. And that's, that's great advice. Um, after tires, I guess, lighting is probably the second most important thing. You need to be seen on the road. Yes. And... Uh, and again, Car Care Council statistics, 26% of the vehicles had a license plate light out. 8% were missing a brake light. Side markers, 13%. Dash lights and indicators, 11%. This is one, Tom, I want to focus in on a little bit. Um, I know some consumers tend to ignore those dash warning lights, but how critical would it be if a bulb was burned out on the warning light or something like temperature? Well, you'd never know the car was overheating. You know, you, some have redundant uh, systems where another light, maybe a check gauges light would come on and still you'd have no warning that it's actually overheating. But what I see a lot is this uh, black warning light elimination tape 
people seem to put on their dashes. That is just ridiculous. I mean, they, they have a check engine light on, perhaps, and they'll put the black tape on the dash so they don't have to look at it. Just ignoring it. Hmm. Have you ever run into a situation where someone has actually pulled the bulb out of a check engine light? I have. It's getting harder to do these days because the uh, instrument clusters are all integrated with LEDs soldered right in them. But years ago, people would pull bulbs out. In fact, the government has mandated if uh, an airbag light, if the indicator bulb is missing, a chime will sound. And I've had a couple customers buy a used car saying, can you put that silly chime out? Well, I can, but you'll have to fix the airbag system. Hmm. They, had, they had no clue. Uh, inscrupulous seller was trying to pull one over on them and, and, and pull the bulb out. Unbelievable. And, you know, when it comes to lights, this is, you know, if driver error is, is the cause of 90% of the accidents, a burnout bulb has got to be a charge, uh, uh, got to be the cause of 90% of the police stops that you're going to run into in your life. Um, I know nine times out of 10, if I'm ever pulled over by a police officer, it's because I have a tail light out or a headlight out or something like that. So you really want to, and again, periodic motor vehicle inspections, generally they, they check the lights all around the vehicle. Um, something as simple as a license plate lights, it may not be important, you know, in the visibility of the vehicle as opposed to a brake light or a headlight, but it's something a, a, a your local constabulary will notice because they're supposed to be able to read your uh, license plate lights and it will cause you to get a, you know, a get stopped and, and possibly written up uh, for, uh, for that type of damage. But, you know, Tom, it gets even better. Um, some people uh, who do understand the value of being seen take it upon themselves to get creative and instead of simply <laughs> replacing the, re the headlight uh, this particular issue forgetting about the cut and sharp jagged pieces of plastic there um, this individual has chosen to actually glue a a flashlight into where the headlight element <laughs> should be which i thought was extremely creative highly illegal of course but extremely yeah. creative um <laughs> Uh, and, and again, Tom, how often do you find a burned out bulb or something like that when you're uh, when you're looking over a vehicle? Is it is it as common as, as those car care statistics would indicate? Um, every car that we do a PMVI on, Tony, I'll say about 40 to 50 percent of them have a bulb somewhere, usually a small marker bulb, because people are, are pretty adamant about making sure their headlights work and, and brake lights. You know, their neighbors will tell them, hey, you got a brake light out get that fixed right away but it's a small marker lights it's a licensed light sometimes if you have uh, like a whole bank of tail lights out back one of the bulbs will be burned out but you still have lights on both sides so yeah that's it, it is quite common hmm. well and again uh you know the largest cause of uh of uh of being pulled over uh is is got to be lighting um aside from erratic driving because it's just so visible especially at night uh, and, and again, visibility is just so important. Uh, that's why something as simple as wiper blades, um, you know, are actually a safety equipment. They're designed to, you know, make sure that you have adequate vision for, for steering that 3,000 pound weapon you're driving. And, and again, it, it, while some people would, would um, you know, uh, wonder why a, something as simple as a wiper blade would be part of your safety equipment, it, it actually is. And these are also things that a periodic motor vehicle inspection program would have spe uh, specifications for and again would be detected in a, in a regular check but you know this um, uh, this is the final slide of the of the pictures we're going to show you but I wanted to put this one in there because sometimes you know even if if everything looks okay um, unless you're a trained technician you may not realize that you have a problem and uh, Tom explain to me what we're looking at right here well, Tony, that's a suspension arm. I su suspect a lower arm off of a car. And the one on the left is damaged. If you see the inside of the elbow has a sharp kink in it right there. This has sustained some kind of an impact and, and, and gotten bent pretty well. Um, these things don't hold up to bending at all. Once they're bent, they get weak and then they can uh, crumble and fall off. End up with like the picture of that Jeep with a wheel folded up from under it. One on the right, of course, is a new one. It's got a nice smooth arc on that inside of the elbow and that's the way it should be. Uh, sometimes people can bump things pretty hard, and this is a cause for alignment or an out of alignment situation. It's gonna cause those tires to wear out, and we just talked about worn tires. I mean, it's it's a safety thing left and right. It's It needs to be fixed. Hmm. And and again, the um, um, alignment, it's, it's your steering and suspension. I mean, it, it sounds like something that um, maybe isn't a, 
you know, as critical as a failed ball joint. But um, just in light and self-interest, what's a set of tires cost these days, Tom? Um, well, anywhere from, uh, you know, $500 to $1,500. And there you go. So just, again, a periodic vehicle inspection can help. If you're going to spend five to fifteen hundred dollars on tires, you want them to last as long as possible. And it's it's just dumb to have something that uh, is easily repaired and will uh, you'd probably spend less uh, having something like this fixed than you certainly would for a new set of tires that are going to wear out prematurely. So this this is not only about safety, it's about helping um, consumers maximize their investment. So that was the last of the uh, of the horror stories we had for you. But uh, the, the main purpose of this presentation is to provide some concrete information, data, and visual evidence of the value that preventive uh, periodic motor vehicle inspections, uh, you know, do work. In fact, and obviously from the pictures we've shown you, it's clear that there are many vehicles operating on our roads with issues that can compromise safety. And since it's estimated, again, that only about half of all consumers have their vehicles regularly maintained, PMVI programs can help ensure that all of the safety problems described within this presentation are found and corrected. This not only benefits the driver and the vehicle occupant, uh, but it helps protect the millions of other vehicles sharing the roadways. And again, uh, you know, when you think about the danger of having an unsafe vehicle next to something like a heavily loaded truck, you can see where um, you know the, the the potential for catastrophe is definitely there, but you know it's important to know that PMBI works in other ways as well. Uh, by having their vehicle regularly inspected by a qualified professional, consumers can catch small problems before they become large expenses, and this has been proven true time and again. And one only has to look at the airline and heavy truck industries to see just how important and effective periodic inspections can be. And Tom, um, what do you have to add to that? I mean, from your uh, uh, experience with customers that, I mean, they actually appreciate the fact that you are taking care of their vehicle for them. I think consumers depend more these days on their repair professionals to let them know what they need simply because vehicles have become so complex. Yeah, Tony, a lot of my people look to me to say, well, what's next to fix on my car? Yeah, they bought a car, perhaps a used one, and we'll write a list of what needs to be repaired, what needs to be fixed now, what can wait a little bit, and what, what's just nice to have later on. But the people that have their car serviced regularly and it's inspected regularly, their, their repair bills are really very minor. It's the ones that let their brakes get to the point where things are falling off of the car and laying on the roadway that all of a sudden now they need big repairs and, and all mechanics are crooks. Now, the people that appreciate their cars and have it maintained are, are quite different from another segment of people who I like to describe. They, they like to think of their cars as appliances, you know, like a refrigerator or a toaster. You buy a toaster and you use it until it doesn't work anymore, and then you just throw it out and you buy another one. Well, those are the people, I think, that drive until maybe they'll put a grain gutter on for an exhaust pipe or, or you know, have their brakes fall off on the road or have their ball joint fall off on them. But... I like to remind my customers, you know, don't don't treat your car like a toaster. Your car is much better than a toaster. Hmm. Good. Words of wisdom, actually. And you're right. Uh, for the vast majority of folks, it's uh, it is an appliance, and it's no surprise these days when consumers open the hood of their new vehicle, what they often see is another hood. Um, you know, they cover the engine with plastic panels, which is a clear message to uh, to keep your hands off. And of course. Again, uh, relying on a qualified professional for all of your vehicle maintenance needs is always a great idea, um, just like we rely on healthcare professionals and plumbers and everybody else. We're here to perform a service, and, uh, and uh, we like to think that we're good at what we do. So, um, Tom, any final words uh, on, the, uh, on the whole preventive maintenance and vehicle inspection programs that are across the country? Well, the ones that are out there seem to work. Um, I just want to say that in, in Michigan, where I live, and I've, I've said this to state legislators before, that without a safety program, you're, you're, you can take the brakes off your car and drive it down the road with no brakes at all, and you're not breaking any laws at all until you cause an accident. And when I say that, you can just see the gears turning in their head and think, hmm, he's pretty much right. You know, no laws have been broken. Nobody's going to get a ticket until he causes an accident. Um, it's just foolish to to you know treat your car that way, and it's cheaper to have it maintained too. Um, 
you know, nip the big problems in the bud when they're small problems, and you won't have the big problems. Hmm. Well, again, and uh, you know, it's uh, catching a a serious problem early is uh, is always a better alternative than the alternative, uh, and ending up in in a an accident that could have tragic consequences. So again. Well, again, uh, that brings us to the end of our presentation. Tom, I want to thank you for your time and your insight. It has been great talking with you. Thanks for having me, Tony. And uh, for those of you who have um, um, questions about per uh, periodic motor vehicle inspections, uh, please feel free to contact the Automotive Service Association. Our contact information is on the screen. You can reach us at 817-514-2900. Uh, or visit our website at asashop.org. That's A-S-A-S-H-O-P dot O-R-G. This presentation has been brought to you by the Automotive Service Association. Again, we continue our advocacy for periodic motor vehicle inspection programs because of all the safety advantages we have shown you today. Feel free to uh, pass this information along. And again, if you have any questions or any other uh, information that you need, Use ASA as your resource. If we don't know, uh, if we don't have the information on hand, we can probably point you to someone who does. Again, thank you for uh, taking the time to watch our presentation. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate having you here today. Thank you, Tony. And my name is Tony Mala, and um, I am with the Automotive Service Association again, um, advocating for periodic motor vehicle inspections because they do work and they save lives. Thanks for your time. Have a great day.